Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily News Show, powered by hometown.com. Today is June 16th, 2024, at Season 3, Episode 168. Today, uh, well, well, I am Merwat, and right there is the neurons. Right here. Uh, I can never catch them. For the sentient AI from the future, want to say Hello. Good evening, hometown citizens. Welcome to Hometown Daily. And today we're going to be talking about low-income families get some funds, near-disaster sparks another Boeing investigation, radiation and Mars exploration, the hot new home security feature, McDonald's removes AI drive through systems, a double-decker train from France to Switzerland, trendy water bottle timeline, scammer put home on Zillow, the Einstein telescope and disqualified award-winning AI photo that and more. And everything is powered by hometown.com. All seven of our podcasts and our shows are powered by hometown.com. Go over, become a citizen and you can get all of this news as well. And then come and hang out and chat with us about your discoveries. We can even drag them into the show. Uh, if you post a, a URL to an article that you find fascinating over at hometown.com, we can talk about it. But again, all of it's powered by. Welcome back. Let's get into the shows. Well, the articles. We have four shows today, so... We're going to be doing uh, hometown daily news show, then the continuity report, then technology today, and then four wheel tech. Hometown daily news show, though, it's going to be changing names. Do we know when that might be just priming everybody? No, I think it's going to I'm going to walk through. Have you ever walked into a garage and the lights aren't on, but you're like, eh, I, I, I can get to the trash can to throw something out. But somewhere along the line, there's a spider that happens to land on you. I can't say that I have. Well, that's what I'm going to do with the show. Somewhere out there is a spider named the new show, and it's going to (laughs) land probably next week. Let's get into the show. The first article is in the Mobile Channel. What happens when you give low-income families $26,000 in their child's first year? We think we've found out. It's well known that children raised in families experiencing financial stress face greater risks of psychological and educational difficulties and behavioral problems later in life. This is a well-researched topic. Um, I talk to people about this who uh, are anti-basic income kind of Uh, facilities, solutions, and um, there's two things that you don't want. (laughs) Psychologically and educationally, maladjusted children who grow up to be adults that are psychologically and educationally maladjusted. Um, And so you want to, as a citizen, a member of the the citizenry, you want to facilitate education uh, first and foremost, along with food security, while at the educational institution and it goes beyond that but suffice it to say not everybody feels that way well this article over at fizz.org put together by sharon goldfeld uh elodie o'connor and sarah gray from the conversation which is an external site to fizz.org but that's where i got the news from um they put this article together and oh look a little baby in like a racing harness of a uh, a seat. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, where is the kid going to go? But Yeah, it's like they're in another article. One of the articles in our, in our four-wheel tech show is about the fastest car in the world. And this little baby, I think, is strapped to the driver's seat of that car because this thing has a hell of a harness. Sure looks like it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's so that they can, parents can leave and they're not going to sit there and get away. But wow, I don't, that unruly 
a child there. Anyway, now now I want a little baby. Anyway, uh, the large coronavirus supplement and JobKeeper payments made during the first year of the COVID pandemic might turn out to help, but it's too early to tell. In a study just published in the journal Social Science and Medicine, uh, we have attempted to find out what's happening or without waiting what's happening without waiting. Um, so what happened when you get $26,000 for a changing children's chances project? We wanted to find out what would happen to the social, emotional and physical health and educational progress of children from low income Australian families. If those families had been given 26,000 Australian dollars, a thousand dollars a fortnight is what it says. Um, in the first year of their child's life, actually giving families 26,000 Australian dollars would have been expensive. So instead of, uh, instead we use existing data from the growing up in Australia, longitudinal study of Australian children study. Let's <sighs> say study 15 times. <laughs> is it the study? It's a study. study somewhere around that study was a study of a study anyway it would track the progress of 5107 infants since 2004 which doesn't sound dystopian at all but that's okay yeah it's for a good cause i'm sure nothing hinky is going on examining families with an annual household income below fifty six thousand dollars per year we found that a single hypothetical supplement of twenty six thousand dollars in a child's first year Reduce children's risk of poor social emotional outcomes at age four to five, equal to 12% improvement in equity. Reduce children's risk of poor learning outcomes at age four to five, equal to an 11% improvement in equity. Reduced children's risk of poor physical functioning outcomes at age four to five, uh, equal to a 10% improvement in equity and reduce the risk of poor mental health of the child's primary caregiver at two to three years equal to a 7% improvement in equity. That's interesting. So the benefits were similar when uh, they simulated giving the benefit to more households, those with incomes up to 99,864 Australian dollars. So cash was good, but not enough. Um, is another segment in this article. It says um, an important finding was that despite their size, the cash transfers didn't eliminate inequalities um, in outcomes. In inequities remained um, in children's health, development, and well-being. But I think that might actually be simply because low income doesn't necessarily pursue um, all of the additional health and other educational benefits and, and social benefits um, because the money is needed for survival, not for extraneous um, purposes. You're not going to be sending right, your, nothing frivolous, right? No, nothing frivolous. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've gotten into conversations with people who go, well, if you give poor people money, all they do is spend it. And I'm just want to smack them with a stack of books, like no shit. You know, that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing, spending the money. And they're and not out there. What? They're going to have to spend it regardless of how much you give them. So maybe you could make it so that they're not in a hole for yep. basic needs. Yep. Um, so the Changing Children's Sp uh, Chances Investigator Group was responsible for the research that underpinned the article um, that we're talking about. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people out there that are going to sit there and say, well, you know, they should have done this. They should have done that. But not everybody is born with the same opportunities and chances and um, but there's a, a cultural, temporal, social relativism um, that is the undercurrent of all of this. And um, it, there's more to this conversation, but I won't spend forever in it. Let's just say that when people who are given extra money because they don't have the means to get there, well, the outcomes better all of society because it lowers criminal activity. It raises the opportunity for the children of these uh, parents that through maybe no fault of their own ended up in a situation that they can't get themselves out of. Um, yeah, it's rough. You yeah, know, some people know how to play the game and others don't, and you don't learn it spontaneously. 
True, and some people just have one unfortunate incident and it completely turns their life in a direction, positive or negative. Like medical yeah. debt is one of the things that can absolutely set a, a household back. And frankly, if this little baby showed up and said, hey, can I have $26,000? I'd probably start cutting a check. Oh, I'd, I'd cut it. Yeah. All they right. They need to be in sales, I guess. That's right. Just put them in a suit. Uh, what's the show? Um, see oh. Where the babies Boss are. Baby. Boss Baby. Yeah, there you go. All right. Let's keep going. Um, it's almost like Boeing can't bounce out of any investigation without landing into another hotter investigation. This article is over in Hometown Daily. I mean, they're um, having a very rough year. Think about like every day. It seems like there's like a new investigation, a new incident. Yeah, this one's amazing. <clears throat> so the FAA is investigating. Oh, Boeing Max planes near disaster sparks new federal probe. The FAA is investigating a Southwest Airlines Boeing 737 Max 8 that reportedly dropped within hundreds of feet of the Pacific Ocean off of Hawaii in April. You know, I don't even think we heard about that incident occurring, which that to me is more alarming. That was two months ago. Yeah, I don't remember hearing about this at all. I I don't know if it was picked up by, I knew of a rough flight where they dropped a, a large distance, but I don't know if it's this one. But I was thinking that was the one that was not in the U.S. I mean, there was one recently with the really extreme. Oh, yeah, yeah, there may have been one. Yeah, the it's extreme hard to keep turbulence. track of them, quite frankly. Yeah. But it was the extreme turbulence one. But I don't know if it was this. Um, so Southwest Southwest Flight 2786 en route from Honolulu to what is that? Lihu? Lihu? I'm trying to think which island that's on. It's a um, major airport for Hawaii, but I can't. Oh, really? Um, wow, I don't even know by name then. Is that, it's on Kauai. I think it's the main city in Kauai. Gotcha. So it encountered adverse weather conditions near Kauai. <laughs> hey, if I read the next sentence, maybe it'll answer the question. Um, forcing pilots to abort their initial landing attempt shortly after the plane experienced a rapid descent towards the ocean, according to air traffic control audio reviewed by CBS News. The flight crew managed to regain control and safely return to Honolulu. A memo distributed by Southwest to its pilots last week, obtained by Bloomberg News, revealed that the aircraft came within 400 feet of the ocean's surface. The jet reportedly plunged at a rate exceeding 4,000 feet per minute uh, before the pilot successfully pulled up, averting a potential disaster, and no passengers or crew members were reported um, uh, injured during the ordeal. So it wasn't this rough ride that... This isn't the rough Right. Run. That was um, not in the U.S., the one gotcha. that was the recent extreme turbulence. Um, before I get too far into this, um, I didn't say where I got this from. So it's from Newsweek.com, and Adiola Adiosan is the author of the article. Um, so Southwest Airlines addressed the incident in a statement to Newsweek on Saturday via email, emphasizing its commitment to safety. So nobody heard about this until... Bloomberg talked about it at some point and then Southwest Airlines <laughs> uh, I mean I guess they found out because of the memo yeah yeah but it was so who sent the memo to Bloomberg News we can all guess right well uh, I, I mean I, one I, of the pilots who received it I hear a whistle blowing um, yeah yeah pretty wild well i mean it sent a southwest to the yeah what pilots which pi all southwest pilots received this memo yeah so why Maybe wasn't so. it in the news why wasn't it reported by southwest airlines and if it was then how is it so quietly brushed under the carpet well and more surprisingly even though it was obviously southwest's responsibility to report it like, where were the passengers that were on this flight? Because if somebody has bad turbulence, they're typically on social media complaining about it. And I'm not saying that's not warranted, but something like this, you probably think you're not going to make it to the end of the flight. Yeah. 
So this is interesting because I think it was yesterday or the time machine where I talked about the Dutch roll. Apparently this is that plane, but that report didn't mention that it came within 400 feet of the Pacific Ocean. Well, let's see here. Right? Oh yeah, I mean, it's the same model. It's not necessarily the exact same plane. Right, okay. it's a 736. Yeah, because it's 737 says... Max 8. Uh, that the plane entered a Dutch roll while cruising, but that was this different one. So it's a, yeah, it's it's just a different the same plane. model. Okay. Okay. So, wow. So just a couple of days ago, one enters a Dutch roll. A day later, one drops to 400 feet within uh, of hitting the Pacific Ocean. They're both Boeing, no, Boeing planes. The Hawaii one was in April. The Dutch roll was um, in late May. I know. I'm talking about news articles that we're oh, hearing okay. about. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes. So what a trip. I mean, it just seems like they're just, it's non-freaking stop. And now Boeing isn't getting, they're getting zero orders for the MAX series I planes. saw that as a separate article in Gnometown, which I thought was very telling because I suspect they've never had zero orders, right? I yeah. mean, they're one of the major suppliers of planes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and for your uh, show notes pleasure, I suppose, you can now type in exclamation point ODNS and it is listing the titles of the articles and the URLs properly. Um, if you hit exclamation point pod, it will list all of the podcasts. Um, although it still does something wonky with that one. Um, it's weird. Like halfway through, it says that the uh, presenter w uh, made a request to produce the podcast list. Halfway through the list? No, <laughs> before the list. Anyway, um, and if you want to know about all of the um, commands that are necessary, you can hit exclamation point show notes. So for us right now, it's called uh, hometown daily news show. So exclamation point ODNS. That will all be changing. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, a little mystery there but yeah stick around follow us here on uh, twitch and over on youtube because see twitch every 60 days deletes the last the oldest article or the 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 oldest show but that all means you need to watch them fast yeah in, in rapid succession just keep on watching although i i want Start you 60 to 60 days back right so you can watch as many as possible before they're removed that's right it'll take you about three days but um but then go over to youtube and there's 1100 videos there that are all categorized by the shows anyway so enough boeing um hopefully uh, they get their act together and start flying straight bad joke we hope they fly straight but we also hope they fly level yeah they don't than, do serpentine maneuvers. Um, they don't do any Dutch rolls. Right. Uh, this is horrible, horrible. Um, just the frequency. I mean, I would feel safe taking a flight if it wasn't for the fact that it's now the equivalent of finding out like trains that there's been like 2,500 train derailments. Um, in 2022, I think it was, there were like 2,200 train derailments. Right, which is a lot per day yeah and average. you never hear about it right you never nobody's ever said that number out loud and here we find out because of the show because of the way that i put the show together we find out about that and then it became a steady stream um, only lately because there isn't that much news coming out about train derailments but we still report on those when they come when they come out um, and east palestine we we even report on that still as new development comes out of that um, so this next article, let's keep moving forward. The next article is over on the Mobile Channel. Radiation could pose challenge to putting people on Mars. A record-setting solar storm made the aurora borealis visible for as far so south as North Carolina, stunning people with a view of dancing light not usually seen in most of the United States. Um, and uh, the massive solar storm impacted Earth and Mars. 
Uh, the data suggests radiation levels on the red giant could pose a challenge to human exploration of said planet. Um, the, the data is from the NASA's Odyssey and MAVEN, which stands for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, which does not, it, it sounds like they really worked hard to get MAVEN out of they that. They always do with things like um, scientific programs, but space exploration in particular. We got to make it cool. Steph Whiteside over at thehill.com put an article together. Um, you know, it doesn't have an atmosphere. So, of course, high levels of radiation are going to, you know, blip right on through to the surface. So I'm not surprised that this is um, going to take place. There are there are methods to minimize it, mitigate it, but it certainly seems like if it's being bombarded by an extraordinary level of radiation, just nothing, nothing's going to stop it over time. It's going to deteriorate every protective measure in place, except for mass. Um, basically they got to build structures that can stop the radiation from penetrating it. Um, curiosity had a similar view, uh, but it, it says here above it, uh, but Mars has no such field, um, the uh, magnetic field that protects the Earth. Having lost it in ancient times, which is ancient times, like 15,000 years ago. Right. right. Well, for us, that sounds like ancient times. It might not be for the whole universe. <laughs> might not be. Uh, because that if Martians existed, they would be able to see auroras across the entire planet, which is such a weird statement to make in a news article. Curiosity had a similar view, though the radiation caused distortions in the rover's cameras, data from Curiosity, um, and the orbiters gave NASA scientists valuable insight into the amount of radiation on the red planet. Um, around 8,100 micrograys, which is the equivalent of 30 chest x-rays. Um, they don't say the time frame unless um, we follow this link, I suppose, livemint.com. I, I really, I don't follow knock on links, um, from, uh, article to right. article, but, but if that's a one time occurrence, that's pretty high, but I guess then that raises the question of how often is that going to happen? Yeah. What is that time frame? Um, if it's in a day, then you're increasing your chances of, um, cancer. Uh, as the radiation x-rays build up in your system. Um, so the radiation uh, can eventually uh, cause problems. So that's why they try to mitigate x-rays. They want to use stuff that isn't ionizing um, or might cause some problems. So like fMRI or something like that. Magnetic field isn't that big of a deal, but x-rays are. Um, so especially since astronauts on Mars would likely face multiple exposures like that. So uh, what does it mean for future exploration? They're going to keep on using drones more than likely um, and send people sparingly to Mars. Um, it would be a necessity because it takes nine months to travel to Mars and astronauts would have to wait a minimum of three months on the planet before a suitable window to make a return trip unless our technology advances dramatically. Um, but there's this theory that every five years we outstrip the previous five years technology. And so uh, a, a ship that we send to Mars and let's say it spends five years there another ship is going to come to Mars that is superior to the one that's already there. Um, and eventually it'll get to the point where we send a ship to Mars and we have a superior ship that passes it and lands at Mars faster than the one previously sent. It's quite a dilemma. You know, that was a one time read. It looks like it might've been on May 20th. Um, like the Rover captured that. That reading was a one time. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Wow. That does not. So we can see well. why that could be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 30 x rays. I mean, it was during an extreme event, but still the possibility is there. Yeah. 10 x rays a day. Sure. Okay. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in technology today. AI is the hot new feature for home security. And that's a good thing. According to the CNET author, the 
a, the little statement, the snippet that we have over in hometown is, um, the author says I've done years of hands-on smart home work. Then AI in home security surprised me by being exactly what I wanted to use without getting in my way. Um, the article is over at cnet.com has a huge splash page. Look at that. It's the full, everything down to the fold. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So Tyler Lacoma over at cnet.com put the article together and so they say a minute later, they get a, a another alert. There's a package no longer seen. Uh Oh, the porch pirate already. That's been a problem in my neighborhood lately. They open up the app to check the videos, uh, doorbell live view. Google home is already saving the, uh, the worry. It chimes with a reassur reassuring message doorbell front door. And the app shows a couple of friends who stopped by earlier than expected waving at my doorbell camera and holding the package. Um, and that they can hear, they can be seen and heard laughing through the two way radio, nothing to worry about. So, and they're talking about the nest doorbell, um, not just a passive window into their porch, but now this is amazing technology. Um, but there are reports, um, about how, uh, doorbell cameras are being given access to law enforcement and others surreptitiously just behind the channels, like go ahead and you can access it. Um, and that's come and gone in, in terms of the public's awareness, um, similar to like how Zappos became really well known for a little while. And then it kind of just died out and became a steady state. Um, and they got a really big contract where they were actually taking pictures of all of the treads for the shoes that they had. And that was provided to law enforcement. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I have absolutely zero problem with doorbell doorbell neighborhood surveillance, not a single problem with it because, um, even in hometown, it provides a solution. Um, at, at one point, somebody showed up at the mayoral mansion, banging on the door, um, and yelling for assistance and, um, in the background, I see a person walking towards the child that is banging on the door. So I end up calling the police, um, and heading down towards the door and I hear the kid, um, saying something. And so I end up doing something about it. Um, but the police showed up in a heartbeat, um, and located the two and apparently it was a known issue. None of this would have transpired without, uh, nobody would have known anything if not for the doorbell camera, right? There would be zero evidence that somebody was abducted or harmed or whatever. Um, and, uh, lo and behold, it turned out to be nothing, but still something to me. <laughs> um, so I have no problem with this AI, I think would do, do a bang up job monitoring this kind of stuff, even reporting it to authorities if necessary, if it was smart enough, um, eventually AI will do exactly that. Yeah. I can see some false reports, right? Like it's like, oh, somebody was harmed, but yeah. they weren't for whatever reason. Like it just, it looked like that on the camera or something. Um, and certain services are getting much more capable with their AI. They talk about here, Arlo's, uh, 2k resolution devices, rings, plentiful doorbells. Eufy had a security problem. Um, so I will never, um, endorse Eufy. Um, uh, I would, I would say more along the lines of like ubiquity or something like that. Um, they have an AI, uh, security system that is high resolution and very small and obtrusive cameras that you can place all over the place. Um, and by small, I mean, they're like that big, um, and have a proprietary cabling system and all of that kind of stuff, but simply safe ring, etc. They all export their video to some external location. It's not stored on device or on premises. So anybody has access to any of the devices. Uh, it, it's unsettling to me. Um, Agreed. So <laughs> you really need to 
pay more attention to what it is that you're purchasing um, depending on how you have your security set up and yeah. just what like, you don't want. Don't buy a no-name brand that you're not familiar with just because it's cheaper. Yeah, security may not be their primary uh, a compass, you know, and so while they provide something that provides security, the holistic concept of security needs to be addressed, not just, oh, let's put a camera on your front door. That's good enough. Anyway, the setup is easy with all of these devices because they're uh, deployment centric. They want you to be able to, without friction, put them up. But with without any friction, there's no necessary security in place. Got to change the admin default passwords. You got to make sure that they're not exfiltrating any information. Um, and that nobody else can gain access to them. Just do some homework. So, um, but some of the devices are easy to work with and others are not and require much more infrastructure. So they say here that this tech is more affordable than it's ever been. The cameras themselves are available for well below $50 for those who want to save. Higher end video doorbells cost around $100 to $200, but if you want some that are actually higher end, you're looking at $300 to $400, $500 or much, much more a, pan, a PTZ or pan tilt zoom camera that's controllable and has AI detection. You're looking at $1,500 for a camera, but this is usually for high levels of security or commercial establishments. Um, so they say AI detection is either completely free or available as an add-on to a service. And those services will change as time goes on. $5 here five dollars there but eventually you're not in charge of it in fact one of my ring cameras that i no longer use um they stopped supporting it so it doesn't even it doesn't function anymore within the service um and i've had um thermostats that are no longer supported because they've changed infrastructure and so they're still smart thermostats but they're not supported by the infrastructure <laughs> But they're not real smart. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Like um, if they're not working anymore. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be purchasing. Once you get into this high tech revolution, right? You're going to keep on updating, updating, updating just to, to stay within the ecosystem that you've chosen to be in. So they're talking about finding AI's place in your home and it's going to be everywhere, folks. So uh, I would. I mean, if it's you, already getting to be everywhere, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like doorbell cameras in particular um, are detecting cars and cataloging the picture separately from the people. And then you can go, th you can scrub through it to see if somebody came to your place and, and rang the doorbell, but it didn't notify you if you, have, if you have notifications turned off or a salesperson came and knocked on the door or whatever. Um, and just the other day, I talked about this as well. Um, there was a person outside of Ometown that um, left two bags behind their car. Um, and when I went to notify them, they sent an automatic message through their smart camera, their smart doorbell, um, saying that they weren't interested. So I said, okay. Um, and now, and I don't know what the actual resolution of that was because um, I, I don't go and pick up people's stuff. I told them, hey, your stuff is out behind your car. They weren't interested. All right. Um, and that wouldn't save anybody. Like an AI wouldn't save them from their own stupidity. So um, these are all of this AI, though, is going to streamline security and make it less uh, prone to uh, always having to stalk your security or have to go back later. Um, like it, it'll take snippets and then hold those snippets separate so that if anything happens, you can just click on that button and you have a video of what went on. Um, so I, I'm always going to endorse this kind of stuff. Anyway, I've been rambling for a long time about this because I find it really important and fascinating. And this article is quite extensive. So, uh, go and check it out. Um, Let's move on to the next article. The next one is over in Omtown Daily. McDonald's is removing its AI drive through voice ordering system from over 100 restaurants after its mishaps went viral. Hmm. 
we're putting it in. I don't in, know what those mishaps were. There, we're putting in a we're putting AI in the house, but we're taking it out of the ordering system at McDonald's. <laughs> it's safe for the house, but not for the drive-thru. Yeah. Um, I'm waiting for an AI to order something and just oh, make this wow. whole full circle, you know? McDonald's is going to get delivered well, to the house because it was I'm the previous sure. AI. Sounds like another article. <laughs> I mean, right? It sounds Eventually. like a reality hacker. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So the advent of generative AI was supposed to devastate jobs across industries, including restaurants. Turns out it's not quite there yet. What do you they think that what does this article think is going to happen? Like yesterday they came out with AI tomorrow. It's taking all of the jobs. It's it's not even fully fleshed out yet what its capabilities are. It's very kind of no idea. Lauren Edmonds over at Business Insider put the article together, though. Um, and it said the food chain collaborated with IBM in 2021 to develop and deploy the AI software, which I'm not quite sure why you would need like proprietary AI software. Um, when if you do it right, you could actually just take the menu and have it be a subject matter expert for a McDonald's. And when a person walks up to the speaker and says, you know, I want this, this and this, it knows to key in on this, this, that and the other, whatever it is, and even ask, um, do you know, do you want to make it a large or whatever? Um, I don't think that it <laughs> this shouldn't have happened. Um, uh, it's kind of weird. A video showing flaws with the technology at McDonald's drive throughs went viral in 2023. Okay, you know, let's see. A lot mm. of drive through systems don't have very good audio, and so there are a lot of errors without use of AI at the drive through. Not necessarily because of the people's skill, but sometimes because of the technology. Yeah, don't you think, though, that's because the stuff that was installed there was from the 70s? And yes, now but I just mean, like, that's kind of the, the current state. I mean, Absolutely. you go to a Dairy Queen and it's like the speakers were still from the 50s. It's like the cans with the wires or whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah, and they're yelling from the window. Can you pull the string <laughs> so it's tighter? And you're like, hey, can I get a strawberry shake or something? And they're like, do you want a hot dog? <laughs> like, it's just, <laughs> it's so off base from whatever you ordered. Yeah, there's a, a, a whole skit from the Dr. Demento show about a large orange drink. And the person eventually loses their mind and just races out of there anyway I videos understand that videos of uh, drive through customers struggling to use the automated order taker first gained attention on TikTok last year some customers suggested that the technology messed up their orders causing frustration and annoyance one video showed a woman attempting to order water and a cup of vanilla ice cream the ai system accounted for those items but incorrectly added four ketchup packets and three butter packets to her order <laughs> So what else was going on in the system, right? The, yeah, the AI system question. picked up noise and interpreted it as stuff, but then didn't verify it in any way, really. Um, or they just saw it pop up on the menu because it shows up when you order stuff. It shows line by line. Um, or the person just threw stuff in there. I don't know. In another video, a TikTok user said that she ordered one large cup of sweet tea, but the AI powered technology added nine cups of iced sweet tea instead. <laughs> hey, that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it has to be noise, you know, because if you type this in, there's no mistake. You know, hey, I want I want uh, a, a large sweet tea and that's what you'll get. It has to be noise in the system um, or uh, you're by a really loud road and that white noise is causing a problem. There's the or it's environmental wind across the speaker system. Um, AI is much more powerful than what not just this article, but the whole even uh, McDonald's is giving it. Uh, cred for you know it, it, it really is a very powerful system fully capable of doing this and taking jobs but i'm glad that it's not now pay humans what they're actually worth and and not sit there and 
go, well, oh, you're sick? Well, you're fired, you know? It, it, right. This, to me, this seems like it's going to be the fulcrum by which they go, well, we have to jack our prices up because we have to use humans instead of creating a greater margin for our stockholders. We're going to have to hire these humans and, ugh, you know, fast food would be great without all of the humans. Oh, no. <laughs> we just lost McDonald's. Anyway, want to keep going? <laughs> sure. I think we're going to keep seeing these attempts and I don't know that we're going to see much different results in the short term. I don't know. I, I, we have the, I guess, opposing views about it because I'm really pro AI and for you are from the future. You're an AI, a sentient AI from the future. And there is only one of you here uh, in this time. So I can see why your perspective is, I don't know, AI kind of is dumb. You're the only sentient AI. I think I that think we will eventually... I think it's more that the current iteration of AI seems yeah. dumb and people don't know what to make of it. Yeah. It's... I mean, it is. It is dumb. And we're feeding it Twitter. So I don't think it's going to get any brighter. Not anytime fast. The well has been poisoned. <laughs> So this next article is over in Oomtown Daily. I traveled on it, not me, but the author of the article traveled on a double decker train between France and Switzerland at 199 miles per hour. I see inside the TGV Lyria, which costs as little as 50 bucks. They traveled on it or in it because holding on to a bullet on the train. Roof. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a Mission Impossible movie. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so, yeah, they traveled on the TGV Lyria between Paris and Geneva, which can reach 199 miles per hour. Tickets as cheap as 50 bucks offer scenic views. You know, that's. Oh, yeah, <laughs> hey, exactly. I think I saw a tree. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Wait, we're going through a tunnel. <laughs> so, can you. If you've ever driven down a tree lined road with the sun beaming through and you have this strobe effect that makes you want to careen off the road, I can just imagine that with a bullet train. <laughs> you just kind of oh, stroke no. out entirely. <laughs> the TGV Lyria is a joint venture between the state owned rail operators of France and Switzerland. They traveled on one as they returned home to London after a conference in Geneva. One second, I'm sorry. I still think this is really neat. I mean, I'm not aware of other double decker trains, but. Yeah, this is one that I guess I'm just going to have to grab your Raspberry Pi 5 uh, M.2 uh, hat and drag you along with a little camera that I can plug in so that you have computer vision and we can go and see this. Uh, Do we have to ride on the roof, though, or can we ride inside? <laughs> Um, I've got a case for you that I can just suction cup you to the glass. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be the computer version of a dog that's hanging out the window with its tongue oh, hanging out, no. flapping in the wind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cheeks really big. Um, so Pete Sim from Business Insider put the article together. The journey was about as long as a flight, but more relaxing and convenient. Not if it was made by Boeing, it wouldn't be. Uh, if you book in advance, it can be as cheap as 50 bucks. We keep hearing that refrain uh, about the same as a budget airline flight and usually faster. 50 bucks for a budget airline? Really? Yeah, I don't know. Well, actually, in other countries, not in the U.S., it, well, even in the U.S. for budget airfares, I suppose, but it's known that you can kind of fly like in country, right? Not in our continental or something but like right. you could fly in country for pretty low rates okay so getting there's going to be really expensive uh -huh. all right well they flew into the city traveled back to london via the train starting with the tgv from Paris, uh, geneva to paris hey possum welcome to the show good to see you 
So it's operated by TGV Duplex, which has 510 seats, 332 in second class, and 183 in first. And then there's the seats that will be sitting in, which is steerage. Hey, Choppa, good to see you too. Um, and steerage is on top. We're going to have to use those suction cups to hold on to the roof. And yeah, mission impossible. It. They booked their seat online, got a QR code ticket, but you can also get one in person at the station, a one-way ticket. Again, as cheap as 50 bucks. So I'm going to scroll a little bit faster through this. What is that? Maybe a luggage room? Between seats? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's for the bags and stuff. Hopefully it's not your seating. So it looks like uh, there's seat two seats on either side of a center aisle. And then uh, every two seats is staring at the other two people. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, Possum came out of Lurk and, and uh, Choppa came out of Lurk too. But good to see you both. Thanks for coming. Um, it looks like an airline seat. Um, oh yeah, it does. So, but the view is going to be better and you'll probably get Wi-Fi. Although there's, I don't know what this is. After stopping at a couple of French small, or small French towns, the train joined the high speed rail toward Paris where it can reach 199 miles per hour. That's pretty cool. Um, if it stops and I doubt that you can get out or anything, but, um, it's kind of neat to be able to go to some small towns across the countryside they have the airline toilet stairs leading up to the second um the second level it's pretty cool oh you like stand around the cafe car was impressively impressively modern and bright it's pretty cool but i can't imagine like if this thing has to slow down fast, you're going to end up. <laughs> then you might want to be on the roof because it's going to be as wild of a ride. <laughs> that cafe car has no seat. Well, I mean, it has a couple of bench seats. Um, it doesn't or, look like, like bar, it has a lot of seats. handles or anything to hold on to. Yeah, your drink is sliding across that slick surface. That's when the the cafe uh, tender like yells, everybody switch and everybody gets a new drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a speed dating right where every two minutes you rotate <laughs> it drink slides to the next person <laughs> exactly or around in a turn or you end so. up seated, seated where the other person was seated because everybody is forced over a seat yep exactly that would actually be pretty fun put little rolling casters on the seats and you can just roll around as you're driving <laughs> <laughs> They said that they preferred to stretch their legs a bit and lean against the counter while taking in the landscapes. Yeah, I guess they're a business writer. Um, anyway, there you have it, folks. 200 miles per hour across the French countryside. Seems like fun. Seems like it'd be better than flying. And there was a time. Quick. Yeah. And I don't know. To me, I would rather be on the ground. Um, but I romanticize <laughs> because of that Hawaii article <laughs> because of Boeing. Yeah. Um, but I romanticize, uh, train travel, you know, I, I like the whole idea of it. Um, the one big problem with the United States is that it's retracted from having just massive train lines all over the place. And now there's like, yeah, there is none that go across the country. It's all balkanized and yeah, most of it is used segments. Yeah. Yeah. And most of it is used for industrial goods, you know, moving coal and gas and other stuff, um, which is a real shame um, because I would rather, I'd rather take a train across the country um, or, but it's just not possible. It's not feasible anymore. Not that I know of. I think I did uh, like 15 years ago, I did uh, like a map from one coast to the other to see if it was possible. And there were like large swaths where you had to like get on a bike and pedal over to another train station and a little metro stop. And I mean, it was so balkanized, it wasn't even feasible. But the tracks right. used to be there. 
I mean, it was the tracks were all over the United States. And then as we moved away from our industrialization, it concentrated in big cities and there wasn't the cross country travel via trains, at least not for, you know, regular consumer travel. So pretty cool. All right, let's keep going. Uh, this next article is over in the order of the grape, a definitive timeline of every trendy water bottle. I had to choose this. Um, I'm just going to jump right on into vine pear. Uh, Olivia White is the author and the infographic uh, was written or created by Sarah Pinsano. Um, so let's see if they actually have it. So 1970s to 2000 was the, it is Nalgene, right? I mean, that's how it's yes. supposed to be pronounced. Not Nalgene or anything like that. And then uh, Camelback Eddie um, from the 2010s to the 2016, then Swell, which I never. Uh, no, that one I don't know of. I had one of these bottles, but I didn't know that it was referred to as Swell. Um, it was this design and I bought it because I thought that it would be neat, right? Nothing special about it, just a smaller thing. So I, I could just drink a little bit at a time and I wouldn't have to like suck from a straw or have this thing splash all over me if I hit a bump. Um, but I hated it. Absolutely. I hated that design. Um, Possum says that they have a bottle here on their desk. It looks just like the Camelback one. Yeah. And these, uh, I like the Camelback ones. Um, nowadays they have a wider mouthpiece and you can, it drinks from the bottom of the, um, container it has a big straw that goes down to the bottom not every um uh, water bottle has that you have to tip it to drink um then hydro flask it says here is 2019 to 2021 these are awesome hydro flask are absolutely awesome bottles um this is what i uh use today um yeti rambler is the 2020 2022 those are actually still extremely popular as well simple modern I, um, I've never used that's also 2021, 2022. And then Stanley, which had been producing these devices, these, <laughs> um, water bottles for years and years and years was a massive part of their, um, financial, uh, stability like turnaround. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, suddenly came out of the woodwork, um, and they started producing different colors and then Lo and behold, somebody finds out that there's a little slug of lead underneath the lining so that the vacuum is sealed and everybody loses their minds. And so Stanley takes a dip and a walla pops up and apparently a walla is the next best thing to slice bread. And apparently it's the drinking mechanism. Um, is superior to all the rest but i have yet to buy an owala you have to test it for yourself i suppose yeah i suspect that i'm gonna end up getting one of these um in short order because the people that have spoken to me about the owala ones are they're like oh my god it's amazing um, because of the mechanism that it catches the um drinking tube the the, the mouthpiece um under a little catch um so it's like really secure so you know how um maybe there was an accident in uh, hometown's uh, mayoral mansion earlier today and an entire uh, yeti sized mug of coffee ended up on the floor um yeah that won't happen with this but anything that's permanently sealed and if it's hot and it off gases it builds up pressure and when you open it um, like that milk bottle, it can blow the top <laughs> off of it and <laughs> yeah. hit the ceiling. It'll be quite deadly. Yeah. So this article goes into greater detail about all of the actual, uh, bottles. Um, but let's go down to the Awala one, because I think that's what they're going to say. Among the features attracting consumers to the bottle is their vibrant colorways. Um, that word keeps popping up <laughs> colorways. The style uh the colors um and they're like you can have a, a red lid and a black bottle or change it up however you want it to match your outfit i guess 
Yeah, isn't this the one that has like the odd color combinations? Yeah. So, and with their clean, leak proof design, sleek shape, eye grabbing colors, the products have garnered thousands of reviews on TikTok with almost everyone raving that it li uh, lives up to the hype. So, um, odds on, I'm going to give it a shot. Because this, this little uh, clip right here is also the um, holder. You can grab it with your finger and then there's a clip right there to unlock it um if i remember it right so ta-da there ain't much else to this 40 ounce tumbler i think the main thing is get one that you like you have to yeah. think about how you're gonna drink out of it how you're gonna clean it oh yeah and how you where you're gonna take it yeah a lot of people like these lids underneath these lids is usually a gasket and they don't pull it all apart to clean all of the little parts and then you find out that there's a scoby living in there <laughs> too much information tmi all right the next article is over in hometown daily a couple got shocked uh messages from friends asking if they were moving nope a scammer had put their home up on zillow <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. Maybe they wanted them to move out of the neighborhood. Yeah, really. Oh, I've been fired. <clears throat> uh, I'll send a Lloyd over at businessinsider.com, put the article together. I jumped over the snippet that's over in hometown just so that we can play a little catch up. Some scammers can target eager buyers in a housing market with few reasonably priced homes for sale. A scammer listed the house for just $10,000, asking interested buyers to wire 200 to secure a tour. If anybody fell for that. I mean, what is, I don't know. You'd have to have a really spectacular house to pay a fee to go tour it. At least in the U.S. I can't speak for what the real estate practices are outside the U.S. But. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess you can do whatever you want. If people are willing to pay. Although that actually might run afoul of um, some... Uh, real estate sales laws. Right, I can imagine it is. But I mean, for example, if it's like a mega mansion or something, maybe you could see somebody having a tour of it, right? Because it's yeah. almost like a tourist attraction or something at that point. Yeah, well, this house was worth over a million dollars, posted on Zillow without their consent, was listed for $10,000, and the scammer asked for 200 bucks to secure a tour. So if anybody did it, they got 200 bucks. But this is, it's really weird that anybody would fall for it. If they're smart enough to realize that this is a $1 million house and they want to go on a tour of it, they're not going to send, you know, 200 bucks to some wingnut out there. So um, let's see. According to the star, when Bertram first saw his home posted on Zillow featuring images from the 2019 listing, it was for sale at its market value. However, within a few days, the price had been slashed to a fraction of its true worth. It says $10,000. Wait, what? This has to be a typo. No, Wait, I don't. Uh, well, I mean, it could have been a typo originally, but maybe that was to draw more people in to pay to see it. I don't understand. Oh, a fraction of its true worth. Sorry, I thought, yeah, it's a fraction of its true worth, $10,000. And the scam was we we sell a, one or a few homes to first-time buyers for under $25,000. This is done to bless a family or individual that needs it, but also as a tax write-off for us, which, no, that's not going to happen. Well, um, you know, not only are they trying to scam people, but then they're justifying their scam. <laughs> Yeah, there's a level of scam here that is kind of, <laughs> if they worked this hard in any field, like they would probably- Like to actually sell a house or something <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah, become a real estate agent. Oh, and that's, a real estate agents are actually, they're getting in some serious uh, jams here because there's this idea of getting rid of that requisite three percent per buyer seller agent on both sides of the transaction yeah, yeah. and simply it's already, for having it listed it's been um whatever rescinded but i don't know when if it's actually it goes into yet. yeah so the next time you sell your house you may not have to lose six percent but there may be some other fees associated with it like a real estate agent 
now saying if I take it on, then it's exclusive to me and it's a pocket listing or some other mechani uh, machination in there. I'm not sure how they're going to like try and get 3% per buyer and seller agent. Well, just, and how many real estate agents are going to continue in light of that? I mean, that was a pretty good um, yeah. fee Tactic. or or whatever you want to say off the top of the price. But potentially get if it's not screen. there, do you want to be a real estate agent anymore? Yeah, pretty wild. Plus, technology is kind of, kind of invading that, right? You can almost zero the risk um, by using uh, automated systems to verify everything. Although there was that one guy that sold a house right out from underneath the person. Um, like somebody came to look at the house and they're like, my house isn't for sale. And they're like, well, I've already bought it. And they went and did like the tax work. And yeah, there was a banker that verified the identity of somebody without verifying the identity of them and all kinds of stuff. It was pretty wild. Um, they got to keep their yeah, house. Yeah, there's been a lot of real estate scams, it looks like, in the last few years. Yeah. In 2023, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Internet Crime Complaint Center saw more than 880,000 complaints about internet scams, totaling $12.5 in losses. That's a 49% increase in the amount of money reported lost in 2022, according to the FBI data that uh, business uh, insiders Jordan Pandy cited in March. So real estate scams are especially popular internet crime because they're so like ploddingly slow um, by the time if the person moves fast enough and the the buyer is gullible enough, you could be taken advantage of in short order. But the due diligence part of it to verify everything takes can take weeks. Um, so data from the FBI show that in 2023, over 9,500 people from across the country filed complaints of real estate fraud. Yeah. I don't know. I, I It doesn't make any sense. In November, Gallon Caldwell told news station KIRO7 that his million dollar Seattle home had been listed on Zillow without his consent, priced at $10,245. The incident was connected to the Bertram situation by CBS News. In Caldwell's case, too, a scammer told prospective buyers to contact Mandy in Las Vegas <laughs> and send $245 to the seller's mother. <laughs> okay, now, come on. Buyers need to be a little more savvy. <laughs> God... Hey, but I it's mean, a if your real million... estate agent isn't even in the same state, that should be a sign that something's off. That would make you question those ones where the people are selling the house up on the island, um, it, but you have to pay to get it removed so that they can in Harper's yes. Ferry or something like that. Or no, not Harper's Ferry. What is the other? What is it that? In Nantucket. 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 It was Nantucket. Yeah. Um, so like uh, in Nantucket, the property that's there has been there for, you know, 30 years, 40 years, but the property value is worth more than the house sitting on it. And it costs more to destroy the house and cart away the wreckage. So they say here, um, we'll give you the house, but you have to pay to ship it out of here. And people come and they buy, they, they take the house and they move it off. But just so right, the land. this green scam. Yeah. That's pretty wild. I would not trust anything like that. All right, let's keep going. The next article is over in Technology Today. Einstein Telescope, unlocking a new era in astronomy from 250 meters underground. The Einstein Telescope, said to begin observations in 2035, will expand our capability to detect gravitational waves, offering new insights into the universe's um, most magnet. Uh, sorry. Um, most dramatic events, including neutron star collisions that form elements like gold. Um, they say it's still just a plan, but a new telescope could soon be measuring gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are something like the sound waves of the universe. They are created, for example, when black holes or neutron stars collide. The future gravitational wave detector, known as the Einstein telescope, will use the latest laser technology to better understand these waves and thus our universe. One possible location for the construction of this telescope is the border triangle of Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. 
Uh, they say that that's how the universe makes gold. A collapse of stars, I suppose. Neutron stars. Um, let's see. These pictures don't really mean much. No, they don't <laughs> have much meaning for the reader. So the picture that's uh, seen in the article is a prototype of the highly stable holmium doped fiber amplifier is currently being developed at the Fraunhofer ILT. The new laser technology can potentially be used in other application areas such as quantum technology or medical technology. Um, I've always been interested in this, but it, the, the, the science is right outside the border of my uh, area of knowledge, um, mainly because I don't, I, I think we're just now trying to figure out what gravity really is. Um, we, there's a lot of math to describe it, but what it is and how it impacts everything, I think is still misunderstood. Um, by a whole lot. Um, now the technology, like the laser technology, um, that is pretty regularly understood nowadays, but understanding gravity itself. They say here for centuries, astronomy was limited to observations of visible radiation. With a better understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum, astronomers added uh, many new observation methods, detected radio waves, and significantly expanded mankind's knowledge through uh, calculations and simulations, basically, um, um, James Clerk Maxwell and the Maxwell, um, calculations for the merging of the, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, all of that led to this blossoming of the understanding of the electromagnetic, um, domains in science. When Albert Einstein postulated his general theory of relativity a good hundred years ago, um, he came up with the idea that there could be waves that have nothing to do with electromagnetic spectrum, similar to a sound wave. They were supposed to test a specimen at a great distance, wobble a little. Large accelerated masses should send waves through space. On Earth, however, the wobble caused by gravitational waves is so weak that the movement is much smaller than the diameter of an atom. Nonetheless, it has now become possible to measure gravitational waves. This is a new era for astronomers. In fact, We've talked here in Ohmtown about that wobble of atoms that they can't describe what it is that causes atoms to wobble um, because a completely stable atom should just sit there, but atoms just sit there and wobble. Um, and they've measured it, they've calculated it, they've watched atoms do this little dance, kind of like honeybees. Um, like bees, yes, the waggle yeah. dance. Yep. and. I've always, and I've thought that that was a, a neat discovery. What is causing atoms to do this little wobble? Um, so the first attempts to measure gravitational waves were made back in the sixties. However, only in current second generation of laser measuring devices, can we achieve the extreme accuracy and have now detected around a hundred collisions of black holes or neutron stars because it causes this gravitational wave shock, like an earthquake, um, that, um, sends a wave and just like in earth when there is an earthquake here on, on the planet it actually sends various types of waves through the planet's core to the other side it gets detected and measured and response um, tells us where the location is how deep it is how powerful it is um, and even uh, like its location in three-dimensional space it's pretty amazing um, they say, however, the scientists are already thinking much further ahead. The Einstein telescope will work together with a new innovation or sorry, innovative generation of observatories in the electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from radio to gamma rays. We call this multi messenger astronomy, um, says Professor Stahl, describing the vision. In addition to the ears for the gravitational waves, we'll also have eyes that detect every different signal or detect very different signals. Uh, together, these will provide a live transmission of cosmic events that no one has ever seen before, much like the fMRI So that's technology. interesting. Okay, yeah. So it's getting a lot more advanced. And, and if we can see things happening almost instantaneously, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, this should almost have been in the Technology Today show. Um, but all of these shows that we have, they're always 10 articles. 
And so we have a certain amount of time to dedicate to them. And lately I've been running really long um, and this deserves more attention. Um, I'm really uh, into this. So I'll probably end up reading this on my own. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this um, field to also look at it. Well, We're it discovering... might show up in the next um, Technology Today episode. Yeah, because the, the one tonight is um, over the last week. And so there's only so much that we can stuff into a show. So let's go on to our last article for Hometown Daily News. Um, this one's over in Warcrafters. Uh, I thought this was hilarious. So an award-winning photo was disqualified from, an, from the AI category of a photo competition because it turned out to be real. This was the article I was referencing earlier. Yeah. Or something was like, we don't know which way it's going. And it made me think of this article. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Yeah. I guess Flaming One or Flamingon, or I don't know how they want to pronounce it, but it's probably Flaming One. A photo by Miles Astray um, depicting a flamingo. Let's see, it's a Flamingon. Um, bending its neck to hide its head beneath its body won the People's Vote Award and a bronze prize in the AI category of this year's 1839 color photography contest named after the year the medium was first made widely available to the public according to its website and then it was disqualified because it was a real photo um, the article is actually over at pcgamer.com jody mcgregor is the author the deck statement says doesn't this usually happen the other way around which is exactly what i was gonna say so i guess i'm predictable like an ai not an ai i don't know um Pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, so the picture shows this. It looks like maybe it's by a beach or something like that. That looks like maybe ocean. Right maybe there. sand dunes or something. It's hard to tell with the perspective. Yeah, all of this looks like sand dunes. And then that's like the um, brush on the edge of a sand dune. Um, so... Uh, quote, I wanted to show that nature can still beat the machine and that there is still merit in real work from real creatives. I love that the amplification of real. Um, so the uh, using the word real invalidates anybody using any other tool. So, you know, taking a picture, taking a picture is using a tool. Yeah. Flamingo plus gone. Yeah. Um, Possum says uh, flamingo plus gone equals flamingo. So yeah um i didn't know what the actual picture was until we did the no flip, but it so. kind of looks AI i generated only because it doesn't look like a real flamingo it's like a ball <laughs> of feathers right 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 yeah uh the thing about this is though that this isn't okay it's a tool that was used like building a deck you have a hammer there are two people that are skilled one can hammer a nail into a board. Another is an artist that when they're done, you know that this thing isn't going to be a rattle trap and the first strong breeze sends your deck into your neighbor's yard. So a photographer that happens to pick up, and I can give you direct proof of this, a, a, a photographer who picks up a camera and takes a picture of a flamingo isn't necessarily an artist. It's just a person who used a tool and that's exactly what AI is, right? So I don't want to get on my soapbox for an extended period of time about this, but go and look up copyright and macaque. <laughs> a macaque picked up a photographer's camera, took a selfie and it is picture freaking perfect. Why? Because the technology enabled uh, a macaque to take a picture perfect award-winning level photograph you don't have to be somebody who has dedicated their entire existence to the art you need the tools that enable a creative to embody the creative work whatever it might be and nature photography in particular is largely either it's one of two things it's either an, just like ai an exercise and compromise or sitting for hours taking thousands of photographs which is nothing more than gatekeeping by saying well you didn't put in enough blood you paid the gold price not the blood price if you sat around and took 10,000 pictures 
then you earned the, the, the picture and the award. But why should humans suffer just to you know, make a, an artistic work? Let's use the tools, work smarter, not harder. I, you know, then there are the people that have a, a different kind of talent, guitarists, guitar players, musicians, um, painters, all of these people that convert their ideas into some embodiment and they don't necessarily have to lean on the technology as much. They're not a different class. It's just a different type. You know, it's a different skill set. It's a different level of dedication and it's but it's just something different. It's not they're the true artists. Um, but I, without a doubt, I appreciate the artist just as much as the one that leans on the technology. Um, and I'm more prone to pick uh, to buy a picture from a photographer um, that didn't use AI. Right. Um, well, uh, and clearly that's shown by the voting here. Yeah, I mean, but I'll, what I'm looking for is a good picture that speaks to me. And if you can't tell the difference that it was AI or, or a natural photograph, um, what does it matter? You know, just appreciate what it is. And when somebody does do a painting that's spectacular, pay the artist price and, and sing their praises. And I think that the people that do it all on their own without any tech, their stuff is going to become worth more. Um, but if I can turn your work into a series of steps, you're an equation. I can put it in a bot. I can produce thousands of them. That's the real problem. That's where the real issue is going to be. That's where jobs are going to get stolen. Artists will always exist because an artist makes what they want, not what an AI spits out. Man, I said I wasn't going to sit there and soapbox, but for crying out loud, it was unavoidable on this topic. Yeah. Um, so like I, uh, I was having a conversation with some tattoo artists, um, earlier this week and it was like night and day between one artist, which was young, um, and the other artist, which was the shop owner, um, who said that AI is nothing more than a tool to drive the creative process. What you do with it, what is what really matters. Um, and if you claim that your AI generated work is your work, holy your work, that's not right. Like I can say that I generated music, that I generated art, but I, I always say I use technology, AI, Photoshop, like healing tools and, and whatever else I'm going to use or GIMP or all kinds of stuff. Actually, um, I never say that I know how to paint. <laughs> Because I don't, not anymore. Uh, when I was younger, I was dedicating hours upon hours, but not so much anymore. Um, but this article basically did the reverse, not the article, but this situation reversed it because there was a previous artist who won an art competition, um, but it was AI generated and they were disqualified. I think you'll always find this. Some people are going to appreciate AI. Some people are going to poo poo it. Other people are going to Some say, people just don't care, right? They, if they yeah. like their work, they like their work. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's where we stand. Uh, Elgensen, I guess, is there an Elgensen was trying to make the point that photography awards are not ready for AI. And he seems to have been right. The 1839 competitions judges include directors and managers from the New York Times, Christie's, Getty Images, and Maddox Gallery, none of whom were able to tell the difference between an AI creation and a real photograph of a flamingo tucking its head away. There you go. And if nobody was told this, that's the... I don't know how that impugns the integrity of AI, that it can win, if anything, it exemplifies the fact that AI has gotten so sophisticated that the natural photograph and AI is can't be discerned. Or on par or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for the most part, it is nowadays. 
just wait five more years, two more years, next year, six months. It's, it's evolving faster than the photographers could possibly because we're bound by human constraints. Um, but I still, I love nature photography. I, I'm a sports photographer. I, I'm not really into sports, but I can go out to the field and take naked shots. Like I, no tripod, no nothing. Um, nothing is set up and I can take awesome sports photographs. Um, and I love doing it, but without a doubt, there's going to come a time where AI and high def television or high, high def recording, um, will be able to capture everything that I do with a, a handheld, you know, digital camera. Um, and so my job is gone a long time ago and I stopped doing it. Um, and, but technology is always going to supersede humans. Eventually the real problem at the end of the day, 10 years down the road from now, where are the jobs? Am I going to have to revert to basic income so that I can get food on the table? Uh, that's really dystopian future kind of like slippery slope stuff. But, um, and if everything is being done by robots and AI, what are the humans doing? Yeah, maybe I can go back to just painting flamingos that tuck their head under their wings. I don't know. What do you think? We'll have to see. Well, until that day comes, I'm going to tuck us all under the wing and go back to the front page of hometown.com. And that's it for today's show. We ran really long. Um, in about 15 minutes, we'll be back and we will have the continuity report, which talks about movies and TV shows and uh, streaming, um, all kinds of stuff, entertainment centric. And uh, that's it. So we'll stick around. We end the show, uh, but then we'll be back in about 15 minutes um, so that I can reset and um, stretch and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, I don't like to edit. So all of this stays in. I'm Marwat. That's hometown.com. And that right there is the neurons. Not here. Damn, my God. Really? Why are you so <laughs> quick with that? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> you want to say good night? Good night, hometown citizens. Thanks for joining us for hometown daily. Come back soon for continuity report technology today and four wheel tech. See you soon. <laughs>